So in this part, I will talk about high potential identification and development. And this is really a sort of prequel to a report that we're currently working on. Um, so rather than uh, uh, describing a new test or a new report, uh, I will give you um, the background, the conceptual background, of where we are coming from, or what our starting point or point of departure is, um, for uh, a new high potential report that we're working on and that will probably launch at some point next year. Okay. Um, and then Shane will discuss a case study with you on uh, talent management. Okay, so um, these are the key questions that I'll try to address. So who are the high potential employees? Um, how can we identify them? Do they really matter? Is the hypo hype justified or not? Um, and how can we motivate and manage them once we identify them? So over the past five or six years, we have been, seen a lot of interest um, and high potential employees. Here are just some uh, screenshots or um, micro scre screenshots that we're using for this presentation from publications like HBR, uh, Fast Company Inc., um, human resources publications, but even generic publications like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times uh, talk a lot about uh, high potential. Often this discussion is framed uh, in the context of uh, generational differences in the workplace, um, perhaps most uh, uh, tellingly, the fact that by 2025, 70 to 75% of the workforce are expected to be comprised of millennials or Gen Y. And uh, another uh, key issue related to discussion of high potential is um, questions or concerns around employee loyalty. Okay, the fact that uh, uh, the psychological and formal contract of employment has changed over the past couple of decades. And uh, that people now um, expect uh, uh, many more things from their employers while at the same time um, being less loyal and, and being always more open to other options. So, I think this introduces a new dimension uh, to the discussion around the war for talent or the talent war. And uh, we always, when, uh, often when we describe to uh, lay people or uh, non-HR professionals or non-industrial organizational psychologists what we do, um, we often say, well, there is the war for talent or the talent war and, uh, and there, there is us. We are the uh, kind of, uh, we designed the weapons for the war for talent, uh, which is not a, a, a very politically correct uh, <laughs> analogy. And you, I guess, are the mercenaries or the <laughs> arms dealers, okay, here. So we went from kind of religious fundamentalists. I've upgraded you to uh, <laughs> arms dealers. So Hypo is a good context to discuss some of the utility of these tools in, in the context of, let's say, enhancing organizational effectiveness. And a couple of years ago, the corporate board published um, a very influential white paper in the US where they concluded essentially that a strategic focus on employee potential is the single thing an organization can do, the most important thing an organization can do to maximize current and future performance. And another element or another reason why um, organizations and managers seem so concerned about that is because there is quite a lot of data actually showing that um, it's uh, fairly difficult, expensive, and time consuming to onboard people. You know, even when you identify talent from outside, uh, they might not fit the culture, they might not know how to operate or navigate the system. This actually happens at all levels. Um, I read a study recently, I think, that quoted that the average tenure time for a CEO is 18 months now, um, which again uh, tells you about you know, why organizations are more interested to promote from within and look at it. And in most cases, 
I'm sure most of you deal with uh, medium to large organizations. They probably already have the talent or the potential, the human resources that they need. It's not that important to go and recruit from outside. So there's now a lot of interest, a lot of popular interest uh, from business and management publications on high potentials. Um, for those of us with a psychology background, this really isn't anything new, especially if you have a background in assessment. And I remember when I was in graduate school, um, 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 a professor uh, once uh, telling me off for uh, inappropriately uh, using the term potential. And uh, I won't bore you with the technicalities around it, but if you think about it, so we are in the business of assessing people and using um, uh, psychological assessment uh, in the real world, and in some cases of uh, delivering assessment-based solutions. I think this uh, is a technically correct term. But in a, in a way, assessment always focuses on potential, okay? Because we're trying to predict something, or we're trying to uh, work out what somebody's probability is to do X. That's actually uh, a well-established but not often used definition of personality. What's personality? Your probability to do X. Okay. Um, so a high potential means high probability and that the behavior X occurs in the future. So really we're just framing a discussion here around potential to contribute favorably to the organization. In most cases high potential means potential for leadership, uh, potential for management, but there are other ways in which uh, uh, individuals or employees can make a difference. So any performance catalyst, you can call it talent, motivation, creativity, personality, predicts future behavior and critical incidents. And we like to um, take the discussion of high potential um, to the work of Wilfredo Pareto, who was a Swiss-Italian a biologist once realized that the peas in his garden uh, produced uh, in very unequal quantities, um, which then led him to formulate. So it's, you always know you made it when you have a law in your name, you know, with your name, <laughs> not just a paper or a book, but there's actually a law. And when the economist uses this to refer to um, to explain economical phenomena or outcomes, and politicians have used and organizational theories have used this law for um, a few decades now. So the Pareto principle is a really good and simple way to define and understand the issue of high potential. It's the fact that in any organization, in any um, social unit, in any uh, significant kind of a congregation of individuals who are there to perform a task, 20% of the workforce, 20% of the people, will account for 80% of the productivity. And 80% of the workforce will account for 20% of the productivity. Um, so we could call the first people the high potentials. Okay, they have the potential to contribute. And by the way, in many cases, what you find is a more extreme Pareto distribution, 90-10. Okay, uh, and you can call these the rest. Okay, uh, and you can also uh, you can apply this. This uh, the Pareto principle is quite addictive. You can use it everywhere, in any organization. Twenty percent of the workforce creates eighty percent of the problems, and eighty percent of the workforce create twenty percent of the problems. And sometimes it's ninety ten, ninety five five. Uh, okay, so. To define or conceptualize or operationalize high potential means understanding what makes these two group differences. And not do it when you already have a lot of performance data on somebody's leadership capabilities, manager, but before that happens. So we want to predict that. Okay? And one of the issues uh, that we find in the real world of organizations is that their parameters, their systems, their criteria are often... Um, inaccurate or ineffective at doing that. And, and so um, we have been paying a lot of attention to the difference or the gap between perceptions of high potential and actually real attributes that contribute to some of that. So in other words, the difference between emergence and effectiveness. Um, what are the characteristics that make you more likely 
um, or increase your probability of being identified as a high potential, but inappropriately identified as a high potential. What are the characteristics that would actually make you a real high potential? So most organizations think that the high potentials are the top performers of today. Okay, and um, there are problems with these definitions, hence the mm. uh, First, only though only 30% or only a minority of these people really have what it takes to become or really actually uh, end up being high performers in the future. Um, second, and related to that, it, more often than not, that's because uh, most of them don't have any people, interpersonal, intrapersonal, or EQ skills. And this is particularly uh, the case in uh, highly technical jobs, um, even when uh, organizations have very effective systems in place to um, recruit, select, and attract uh, experts in a field. Let's say Google hiring the top software engineers in the world. Uh, which they can do is not that difficult, especially if you have two to three million job applications every year. You can, you know, just hire the top 1% and they'll be really good at that. Uh, but most of these are people who are very happy to work as software engineers and be problem solvers. And if they're young, even if they have really good technical expertise, you can only, uh, they can, in most cases, advance their career only if at some point they can manage others. So the combination here will be maybe high IQ but low EQ, and then they might be really good at the job they were doing, but they don't have the ability to manage teams, uh, build and maintain high-performing teams, and so forth. And there's also uh, data showing that even within the same job, not when you uh, switch people from one job to another, let's say uh, uh, a specific task to being a manager, uh, Performance is often inconsistent, especially in, in the long cycle of employees, when you actually have employees who end up staying for some time at the company. So there is also the fact that I would say there are only two questions that we should ask in assessment or with, rela with regards to assessment-based solutions. And question number one is what should we assess? And question number two is, how should we assess it? These are really just the two. It's as simple as that. Um, already, question number one is a problem, especially because organizations tend to have uh, competency models or frameworks, which are the joint venture or the byproduct of the marketing team and the HR department. And uh, um, they tend to overestimate how unique the organization are, and in many cases they don't make any sense. You know, so they don't make uh, logical or conceptual sense. So the bad news is that every company has its own hypo model as well, which is derived from these competencies. And again, if you don't know what you should assess, then it doesn't matter how you assess it because you focus on the wrong features. But the good news is that they're all the same, actually. And this is like, I think you heard a presentation on that included. Um, Within the PBC Hogan 360 model, you have the four dimensions that uh, underlie all competency models. Okay, can you manage yourself? Can you manage other people? Can you work in the business? Can you work on the business? These are the four key dimensions. You can translate competency models into those. You can also translate competency models into um, the HPI, the HDS, and the MVPI. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this at the end of today. But this is the working model that we have for uh, high potential employees, OK? And the first three um, boxes in this model, you have already seen uh, when I introduced the EQ leadership session. You know? To what extent are you rewarding to deal with? To what extent are you able or smart? And to what extent do you have a high work ethic, or you're productive. We think that those three things are determinants of career success. So as I said, if you have the three, you'll probably be successful. Now, to really be a top manager or a top leader, you also need to be leader-like, and you also need to be entrepreneurial, have the ability to uh, foster and promote 
innovation or positive change in broad terms in the organization, which doesn't mean that you are um, you know, incredibly artistic or have a creative mindset yourself, but you have to be able to evaluate and make right decisions concerning creativity. Um, so we can translate these and, you know, this mapping um, is more or less indicative. You know, you can come on and, and, and say, well, why don't you include this scale or this? And you can do it at the Higgs level, you can do it at the scale level, but you can translate more or less these attributes into specific scales or aspects of the HPI, the HDS, and the MVPI. And you can do the same with the catalyst or main triggers of um, success um, as a leader or leadership potential. And later on, I'm going to show you a different approach to doing this, where you can actually customize the profile um, based on the job, on job families, and uh, so forth. So this is really what we should be looking for now, or what organizations should focus on. Um, in reality, the main obstacle um, to implementing these things is not absence of knowledge. I mean, that's part of the problem. But the uh, bigger pr uh, problem is that um, organizations rely more on actual performance. And performance indicators tend to be contaminated or polluted by office politics. Okay, so there's the, the politics of high potential identification, and uh, there's uh, the realities, or if you like, the science of high potential identification. So performance appraisals every, everywhere are influenced by office politics. Actually, a different way to look at this is, uh, in most places, people will get promoted because they're rewarding to deal with, as opposed to their ability or their hard work. In other words, most supervisors, given the choice between somebody who is really able or really hardworking but difficult and a pain to manage and apolitical and not very savvy, or somebody who's not that able, not that productive, but rewarding to deal with and sucks up to it, will promote this person, which is good for them in the short run, but bad for the organization in the long run. Hypo nominations, as I said, don't predict performance. They are an indicator of who is successfully or effectively navigating office politics. And my colleague, uh, Ben Dutner, in the US has published a very nice book on this. It doesn't have hypo in the title. That's, that's why it hasn't sold very well. It's called The Credit and Blame Game. And uh, Peter, I think you should add it to your list if you haven't seen it. But it's just about the difference of how um, people take credit for other people's work and blame others for their own mistakes. And uh, it has a very nice and interesting, fascinating breakdown of how this happens in different cultures and across different ages. But effectively, it, 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 well, this is a key determinant of the gap or the difference between individual career success and organizational effectiveness. Okay, the fact that these two things are often uh, almost mutually exclusive. So we know that there are consequences of poor high potential identification. I mean, two main ones. First, of course, and especially if you believe in the war for talent, and if you, most organizations do complain that they can't uh, source their key positions, that uh, they have uh, key gaps in uh, uh, many positions, and that their uh, competitors are stealing their best employees, and so forth, and that um, you know, there, there is a shortage of talent, effectively. So failing to identify true high potential individuals causes them to leave for a competitor. Okay? And often it causes them to be upset, so they will work even harder for a competitor uh, to destroy their previous employers or their previous bosses. And politics continue. And secondly, of course, identifying fake high potentials alienates co-workers, especially the true hypos. Think about it. This is where fairness, where integrity, where organizational justice becomes very relevant. If you're doing really well and you're performing well and you have potential to perform well at the next level and your managers are rewarding people who are incompetent, inept, and uh, Machiavellian, well, at some point, you'll be fed up. So this is what our simple model looks like. And we have uh, essentially uh, a two by two matrix where we distinguish between emergence and effectiveness. 
And there, is a, uh, there are implications for identification and for development uh, um, in both axes, basically. But ultimately, I think our job should be to persuade organizations to make fewer mistakes um, identifying uh, high potential. So stop uh, labeling people who have no potential as high potential, for the reasons just mentioned. And also truly identify and nurture people who have talent for leadership or other potential. Okay, so we want to get more people here um, to uh, be designated as high potential and uh, directed through uh, uh, developmental route and fewer there. There are implications, interesting implications from an employee development point of view. You know. What do you think is easier? Um, take fake hypos or people who have the ability to um, emerge but not much ability to be effective. Take these people and increase their potential for being effective or help these people emerge. People who already have the potential but are not self-promoters, but are not, you know, Visible. What do you think is easier? First or second? second. This exactly. So that's what we're working at the moment. And uh, Rodney Warrenfels, who manages our training um, and part of our consulting business, has done a lot of work around political savviness. So being uh, improving and boosting people's political skills, networking ability, in a way, uh, make them more visible. To some extent, that concerns EQ training, okay? Because it's easier to then, um, you know, suppress those characteristics once people get to the top and rely on the skills, the ability that people have already, than the other way around. And to try to turn people who are self-centered, narcissistic, natural self-promoters into people who care about teams, who care about the well-being of others. Of course. For the few people who are successfully identified as high potential, well, you just need to retain them. So you just need to engage them. And, and, and those people are, you know, are replaceable in a way, or you could replace them. So, um, but I'm going to say something a little bit around retention. And uh, I always quote Warren Buffett on this. He has a great line that concerns uh, or about you know, the fact that many organizations they face the uh, uh, paradoxical problem that when, and it doesn't happen very often, but when they successfully manage to identify their true high potentials, they of course want to invest money, resources, and time on them uh, to develop their potential and to actually encourage them to stay. Okay, so they might send them to reward them with executive MBAs or uh, um, other training courses, etc. And, and at the same time, that makes them more attractive to their competitors, to other employers. And, and the line for, from Warren Buffett is, the only thing that is worse than training people or investing people, training people who then go away, is not to train people and have them stay, which I think is a great line. So you have to do it anyway. So the key is to engage uh, people, especially your high potentials. And we have done some very interesting research around this area, which shows that, ironically, um, people who have more potential for leadership and have true potential, they actually tend to engage more naturally. So they find it they're dispositionally more inclined to find meaning at work, to give the extra mile, to work harder, and to find purpose, and they take work more seriously. And this great uh, work done by um, Harvard Business School researchers and a book that sums up most of those work by Teresa Amabile is called The Progress Principle, which I think is a very smart take on engagement and explains some of this, of the dispositional or default inclination of high potentials to be more engaged. She said that, well, although engagement does lead to higher levels of productivity, the relationship is stronger the other way around. Higher productivity levels engage people. In other words, 
give people tasks that are relevant, that are uh, well suited for their skill set, their competencies, assign them to the right, the right tasks, let them be successful and perform to the highest level so that they feel, and then they will engage. And it's a very interesting thing, especially if you think that engagement also has been sort of hijacked by the positive psychology. As you can see, I'm paranoid with the positive psychology community. It has been hijacked by the positive psychology community and has become a kind of wishy-washy, feel-good, you know, let's all be happy at work kind of thing. Uh, it's not about being happy, it's about having a meaningful um, a perception of your career, your task, and understand why what you're doing is meaningful. There are also issues surrounding, and recently I was approached by somebody who wanted to uh, kind of uh, co-create with us an engagement report based on personality. And we have that data already. We know that people with higher EQ or with uh, higher potential for career success and leadership, they tend to be more dispositionally engaged. The problem is that that's kind of morally dubious. You know, if organizations will solve the engagement problem by hiring people who are just happier, A, they won't be more productive, and B, uh, it, it shifts the problem from incompetent management to, uh, the, it puts the problem or it shifts the discussion to uh, engagement being a problem from the responsible, um, where the employees are responsible, where it doesn't reflect what the company is doing. So engagement is a management problem and you have seen already in the leadership value chain that I showed you that good leadership and the personality characteristics that predict leadership affect engagement. And we have discussed uh, somewhat how this happens at the level of teams, uh, team engagement or team um, uh, level of involvement, and that uh, creates performance. This happens also at the individual level. So managerial behavior drives employee engagement. Employee engagement drives business results. Good managers and I, I really like this, actually create more high potentials in their workforce. Because you take people with the same skill set, with the same style, with the same expertise, and you engage some of them, they will perform higher. So you're actually created, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the others, you actually create low potential individuals out of potential hypos. So, uh, we know, and I always show this because it, it, uh, it's a very uh, simple illustration or depiction of uh, the disengagement epidemic that we are seeing, uh, not just in America, where most of these data come from, but all over the world. Um, consultancy Gallup assesses over 3 million people every year. Uh, they have their 12 questions that uh, are the standard or universal climate survey an engagement questionnaire, and they have been finding for over a decade now that most individuals are either not engaged or actively disengaged at work. So there's only about 30% of people of the workforce who are engaged. And I would say this is based on data derived from organizations who actually bother asking their employees whether they are engaged or not. Most companies today still don't. So you, you can expect the actual figure for engagement to be even lower. We also know that the key or chief factors for disengagement mostly have to do with poor management. So these are the most frequently cited reasons for not loving or hating your job. Number one is always boss or supervisor, and you have heard the phrase, I'm sure, uh, people join organizations but quit their bosses. That's a universal uh, phenomenon. And many of the others have to do with management as well. So having no control over work, bad decisions by upper management, poor teamwork, etc. So they all have to do with management. So mismanaging engagement or the mismanagement of engagement is a critical factor or plays an important role um, affecting or influencing the proportion of people who might have uh, uh, the, both the capacity and the patience to remain in a role to be the future leaders of tomorrow's or the high performance. And, and this is a, a very simple slide to show, again, the little self-awareness or the discrepancy between how managers evaluate their ability to engage and how employees evaluate their manager's inability or unwillingness to do so. Okay, So most managers think that uh, um, they're doing a fairly good job, 
Um, but most employees think that that isn't the case. And uh, even in companies that assess employee engagement, who use yearly or biannual employee engagement or climate service, 12 employees, 12% 12 of the employees of the workforce typically report that their companies deal with engagement. And um, I have spoken to a lot of people who, are, uh, who make a living and focus uh, on assessing employee engagement. And I said, well, it's sort of like a double-edged sword. On the one hand, employee engagement has become another box that companies need to tick. So it's like up there with creativity and diversity and social corporate responsibility. On the other hand, 90% of our customers don't really care about them. So they tick the box, they give employees 200 questions, they ask them if they like the cafeteria, if they want the toilets to be refurbished, if, uh, and then they don't do anything about them. Okay, the action part is missing, which of course pisses employees off. It's worse than not asking, okay, asking and not doing anything about it. So engagement is crucial for hypo-retention, which is uh, perhaps you know, as important as hypo-identification. Hypo-identification is necessary but not sufficient for successful or effective high-performance, uh, high-potential programs. And I think engagement is crucial for retaining high-potentials. Um, it, it's interesting that although high-potential individuals tend to engage more naturally, as soon as they're disengaged, they're less patient and less tolerant, so they also leave. And they also have more options to go somewhere else. Okay? And um, uh, this is something that we find across different cultures. And high potentials, they have options. I mean, if you're disengaged um, and unhappy, have no tolerance, but no other offers, you put up with it. Okay? I say people are much more willing to put up with a bad job than with a bad relationship. This is another... Uh, uh, universal fact. Um, okay, so in conclusion, hypo identification requires valid empirical tools. That's why we're developing our own high, pot high potential report. We have used a lot of customized and project specific high potential reports in the past. This will be a generic one. And this will again focus on uh, both emergence and effectiveness. How can you help people who are normally identified be more effective? How can you uh, help people who are, have the potential to be effective to, be, to emerge as hypos or be identified? Of course, you also have to change perceptions. You have to change and replace toxic systems, political systems with more evidence-based systems. Hypo management, especially managing and motivation influencing the levels of motivation and drive and retaining people requires engagement and engagement is a function of leadership. So a conclusion is that personality is key to identify high potential and also those who can identify and manage high potential. The personality of those people influences their ability to be more evidence-based, less political, more fair and more competent at that.